Welcome to our virtual Gallier gathering. We are the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. I am Dr. Anastasia Scott, Director of Educational Programming. We have made Gallier gatherings free to you all in this virtual platform since April 2020, but, it's not, but it is not free for us. As a small museum still trying to stay afloat in these evolving times, we have made our virtual lectures pay what you can to help us cover the costs associated with putting on this program, such as speaker honoraria. Your generosity is appreciated. Thank you to those who have made donations and please consider a donation for future, for future virtual lectures. Membership also helps with sponsoring programs such as this. 2021 is our 140th anniversary of the Women's Exchange, our owner and operator of our museums, and the 50th anniversary of the museum. Please join us in celebrating our anniversary by becoming a member. If you are impacted financially by COVID-19, we are offering student membership for $25. If you join now, your membership is good through August 2022. In his talk, Finding Oscar J. Dunn, Reviving the Memory of Our Nation's First African-American Executive Officer, Dr. Brian Mitchell will examine the life of Oscar James Dunn from his manumission to his untimely death. Dr. Mitchell will discuss how and why Dunn was forgotten and the efforts and research involved in reviving his memory. Brian Keith Mitchell is a native of New Orleans and a resident of North Little Rock, Arkansas. Mitchell identifies himself as a transplanted New Orleanian who is forever thankful to the state of Arkansas for welcoming, welcoming him during the chaotic aftermath of the hurricane. Mitchell is currently an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Eth I'm sorry, on Race and Ethnicity. A graduate of the University of New Orleans, he received an MA in history and an MS in urban studies. He also completed his terminal degree and a PhD in urban studies with a concentration in public history at the university. Prior to assuming his current position at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, Mitchell was a decorated senior federal investigator at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and a winner of the Federal Investigator of the Year Award and a winner of, of a 2021 Phyllis Wheatley Award for Monumental Oscar Dunn in his radical fight in Reconstruction, Louisiana. Mitchell has been married to Camille Guess Mitchell, a Little Rock native for 20 years. The pair have two children, Mason and Chloe. Dr. Mitchell's book is on sale at our museum exchange shop. Please visit our website or in person. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Herman Greenman Gallery Historic Houses, we are managed by the Women's Exchange. We preserve two 19th century French Quarter homes and through their architecture, collections, and history inspire discourse about our collective past and its relevance to our present and future. Visitors, students, and researchers explore such diverse topics as the lives of the house's owners and enslaved people, free people of color, open hearth cooking, morning rituals, and the entrepreneurial pursuits of women. At the end of each Gallier gathering is a survey we send out asking for your feedback. Please know that we read your feedback and try to make this content as relevant as we can. So please fill out the survey we send out after each Gallier gathering. Your feedback is valuable. This talk will be recorded and available for viewing in 24 hours on our YouTube channel and website. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you won't miss out on any future recorded programming. If you have questions at any point during the lecture, 
please save them until the end or submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. It's helpful to use the Q&A feature versus the chat feature because it's hard to track the questions. It's easier uh, to organize all of your questions if you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Brian K. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell, you're muted, I'm sorry. I said, it's difficult to be away from the city and, and I, every opportunity I get, I'm happy to speak in New Orleans. Uh, there's a saying, you, you can take the man out of New Orleans, but you can't, you know, you can take the man out of New Orleans, but you can't take the New Orleans out of the man. Uh, so anytime I, I possibly can, I, I'm sharing what I know about Dunn uh, and I love coming back and doing lectures in New Orleans. So. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and put up my PowerPoint and I'll begin the discussion. One of the, uh, one of the things that people have been asking me and, and my presentations have been sort of an evolving uh, set of presentations. Uh, as people ask additional questions, the number of slides sort of morphs and grows because people have uh, very, very interesting questions. And one of the questions that I always get when I begin talking about Dunn is explaining how I got connected to Dunn and, and how I came to understand about Dunn. What I, when did I first find out about Dunn? When did I first begin researching Dunn? So I, I started making additional slides uh, to explain this. So I'll start with the, a very early slide. And, and I know uh, this slide is about uh, my, my great grandmother who I did have uh, the pleasure of spending a number of years with before her passing. Um, her name was Maddie Jackson Dunn. And she was born in 1897 in Clinton, Louisiana. Those of you who are familiar with Clinton know that it's in East Feliciana Parish. And um, she, was a she was the daughter of Robert and Ella Jackson. Uh, Robert was the son of a slave, um, uh, Ger uh, Jane Gerald Jackson and the son of a white planter, a man by the name of Elias uh, Jackson. And at 19, at 19, Maddie Jackson ma married Emmanuel Dunn. And this is where the Dunn connection in my family comes from, is the, this connection to Emmanuel, who had a family both in East Feliciana Parish and in the city of New Orleans. Um, this is my grandmother as I knew her, so it's my great grandmother as I knew her. Uh, and my story and connection to Gunt Dunn begin in the year 1976. Those of you who were around in 1976 will remember that that was the bicentennial year. That was also the year that I returned to the city of New Orleans from Chicago where my mother had been attending a school. Uh, my mother wasn't able to come down with me, so she sent me with family. And I was staying with an aunt, and every day after school, my aunt would pick me up from my grandmother's house. And my grandmother was walking distance from my elementary school. And like most grandmothers, there really wasn't much, much to do at her house. Uh, she wasn't high on television. She did a lot of reading. And there were a number of scrapbooks and photo albums at her house. So every day I would go through scrapbooks and photo albums. And this is a photograph of me in 1976. You notice the, uh, the flag behind you, bicentennial year, and the leisure shoot should be an indicator um, that it's somewhere in the 70s. Uh, 
Uh, this is Paul Lawrence Dunbar Elementary School today. That's where uh, I went to elementary school for that year that my mother was in Chicago. And I, in fact, I didn't, I don't think I was there for the entire year, just a portion of that year. Um, and one of the things that we were learning in Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, School at that time was about the government, you know, when we were talking about the bicentennial year, um, there was a lot of discussion about uh, how our government was organized. And one of the things um, that we discussed in some detail was how the state's government was organized, who was the governor, who was the lieutenant governor. And we went through the names of the current governor and lieutenant governor. And then the students were asked if they recognized or knew of any other governors or lieutenant governors that had served in Louisiana. I raised my hand and uh, I was called on and I said, Oscar James Dunn. And the teacher said, I don't know an Oscar James Dunn. And I said, well, he was the first black lieutenant governor of our state. And she said, well, I think you're mistaken. There's never been a black lieutenant governor of Louisiana. And, and then I made a tragic mistake that uh, students quite often make. They corrected the, the teacher once again. I noted that Oscar James Dunn was the first lieutenant governor and he even acted as acting governor. And then I went a step further and I corrected her by saying when she said, no, they'd never been a, a lieutenant governor that was black. I pointed out that they had been three. When I first found out about Dunn uh, was one afternoon while I was sitting at my grandmother's home, my great grandmother's home. And I ran across this article. The article reads, and this is an excerpt from it. He was to them, black Americans, their great preservative, their leader, the embodiment of their hopes, the real Moses who, as they fainted and famished in the struggle to reach the goal of acknowledged manhood, smote the rock of adversity till it gushed forth cheering waters of hope. It was Oscar James Dunn that led his people from the land of oppression and bondage. And I wondered, well, how could nobody have ever heard of this person? How could my teacher not know that Dunn had been Lieutenant Governor? How could she have never heard of PBS Pinchback? How did she never know about Cesar Carpenter Antoine? And as I went to school, um, I went from second grade on through high school, I heard very little about the reconstruction period. And that was until I reached college, until I got to the University of New Orleans. And I took a course in Louisiana history from uh, a historian by the name of Raphael Casimir. Um, and he was a wonderful mentor. He, he is a wonderful historian. And he was really the first black historian that I ever met you know, in person. I'd read John Hope Franklin. Uh, you know, I, I had read uh, the works of a number of, of Black historians, but I'd never known them uh, personally. I never sat and asked questions. And Raphael Casimir was the first person that could really answer the questions I had about Reconstruction. His class was interesting, engaging. I saw uh, facets of myself for the very first time in American history in that class. And although I'd always loved history, I became very, very engaged and, and, and began asking questions like a historian. I wanted to do more research. I wanted to go to archives. And one of the things Dr. Casimir said to me that always sort of uh, hung on was we know very, very little about them. And he said, um, there, were, there were only three people who had, at that point, written to any great measure about Dunn. And I read those three papers, and as I uh, kept, uh, kept on with my education, uh, I decided that uh, that would be the topic of my dissertation. And I decided that I was going to try to find out as much as I possibly could about Dunn 
and see if I could construct a biography of Dunn. What I came up to was astonishing, right? I, the things I was able to discover uh, were groundbreaking. First of all, um, I was able to find documents that shed light on Dunn's life, um, particularly his life prior to being emancipated. Um, I found records um, of his purchase. I found records of uh, his sale. I found records of his manumission. And what we were able to glean from those records is that Dunn was born in 1822. And at the time of his birth, he was the property of a man by the name of George P. Bowers. And Bowers was a commissioned merchant who resided in the Vucare. On February 5th, 1831, at the age of nine, Dunn was purchased by a man by the name of James Dunn. And James Dunn um, was a free man of color who was from Petersburg, Virginia. He came here in 1819, in the fall of 1819, uh, with the theater impresario, uh, J. H., um, James Henry Caldwell. And he came here with for a specific task. Caldwell, being a theater impresario, had hoped to build a chain of theaters along the Mississippi. And he was a Caldwell's stage carpenter. So his job was to build the sets that um, were on the first American theater stages. Um, it appears that if from following uh, the records of James Dunn, that James Dunn's uh, fortunes prospered alongside that of his boss, um, the Caldwell. And he was able to buy a house. He was able to um, uh, buy a boarding house where he and his wife owned it. Uh, and he was able to free uh, his family. And by this time, uh, the slave uh, mother of Dunn, a woman by the name of Maria, um, not only has Oscar, but she has a two-year-old daughter for James. And he, uh, he purchases the entire family for the sum of $800. And we know that this is a, a benevolent, that this isn't a meant to purchase them as slaves because he doesn't hold them in that position of servitude very long. He frees them as quickly as he possibly can. So as soon as he's paid off that debt, he emancipates the entire family before the police jury. And that happens on December 13th, uh, 1832. Um, and, and this was very, very important for Oscar because up until that morning, Oscar uh, was always referred to just by that singular name. He had no last name. He wasn't a free person of color. He's Oscar, the, uh, referred to as Oscar the slave. He was an enslaved person. Um, However, when he's emancipated, uh, he embraces a new name. And in that new name, he encompasses the name of his stepfather, becoming Oscar James Dunn. Uh, and that, that is symbolic to me. Uh, and it's symbolic that he is a reborn. And, and this decision, this decision to free him will make the world of difference for him. Um, one of the most important things that happens due to this emancipation is not the naming of Dunn, but the ability Dunn now has to attend school. And one of the things that was uh, largely in question, because I'd read the previous uh, writings on Dunn, uh, writings by Perkins, writings by Christian, um, and one of the things that was in question was how did Dunn get educated? And one of the things that uh, in many, in two of the articles, they noted that he had learned um, to read and write from boarders, uh, from actors that stayed at the boarding house. And I discovered that this isn't at all true. Um, Dunn attended a school, his parents take tuition. In fact, he recounts exactly how much his tuition was in uh, a federal investigation of the Mechanics Hall riot. He says, look, I went to a school and this is how much my parents paid for tuition at that school. 
we do know some things about that school uh, from uh, the obituary that is written by one of his closest friends. And that was a huge discovery because up until the point of that discovery of uh, that obituary, uh, the obituary that had been recounted over and over in the historical record was a account of Dunn's life that was given to him by a former boss. And we'll talk a little bit about this boss in a, in a, in a few minutes, but um, how much does your boss actually know about you? I mean, most people don't go home and hang out with their bosses too much. They go to work and they come home. And but Dunn and this particular uh, boss will have a falling out in, 18, in the 1840s and uh, Dunn will abscond from him. So what he may have known about Dunn's home life, what he may have known about Dunn's early life um, is very sketchy. Uh, the person who writes this more intimate account of Dunn's life is a fellow Mason and uh, also a man whose family had come from Virginia, a man by the name of John Parsons. Parsons' account of Dunn maintains that he had known Dunn since early childhood and that Dunn had attended school. And at the age of 14, uh, his father realizes that he will need to have um, training as an artisan to survive. He'll need to have some sort of occupation. So Dunn would be apprentice uh, to uh, master plasterers. And it's at that point that Dunn develops a trade. And Dunn does this trade, even though uh, there's evidence to suggest that Dunn um, didn't like plastering very much. In the 1840s, Dunn has a mysterious falling out with his boss. And I know I saw Jari in uh, Jari Andre in the, uh, the audience. And uh, he sent me actually a, uh, a cemetery index really recently that sheds a little light into perhaps what have, may have been at least a factor in this running away. Uh, Dunn's father dies in the very year that uh, Dunn absconds from uh, his employer. And this will cause a lot of confusion in the historic record. This attempt to have Dunn arrested and returned to work uh, will be confused in the historic record and many will believe that Dunn was a runaway slave. And, and the, uh, this, this notion will be uh, put out there by many of his rivals. And uh, that was meant to diminish his stature in the historic record. Uh, we don't know why Dunn ran away. Uh, we do know a lot about, a little bit more about what he did and during the time he was plastering. Um, during the time he was plastering, he became very, very interested in music. Um, his employer at the time was a former vocalist in the city and Dunn initially began studying music under that employer. However, uh, Dunn begins to branch out and then begins to study the guitar under an Italian master residing in the city by the name of Torna. It uh, was never able to find out Torna's first name. Um, so all I know is that the Dunn's music teacher was a man by the name of Torna. After running away, he takes up the, the profession as a music teacher. And he will continue as a music teacher in the city of New Orleans to 1860, till right before 1860. And the reason that uh, he stops teaching music is a scandal breaks out in the city of New Orleans. And if any of you would like to uh, know more about the scandal, I, I cover it in my dissertation. 
And there's a little bit of, there's a section in the book about it, but it's also covered in Sybil uh, Kind's Creole. Uh, a music teacher by the name of Martin uh, will be discovered uh, to have had affairs with a number of his, pu of his pupils. And Martin was uh, also a free man of color. And this, as the new newspapers begin to uh, print the initials of some of the women that he has affairs with, uh, the whole profession of being a free black male teaching white female students falls under the scrutiny of the mob. And Dunn will decide at that point that it is no longer safe to be a music teacher. So he'll leave the, the profession of teaching music return briefly to his trade as a plasterer. And I said that he, he did this all the way up until the Civil War breaks out. When the Civil War breaks out, Dunn discovers that there is an opportunity. And that opportunity that he discovers is placing um, recently em emancipated freedmen in working uh, conditions with plantation owners. Uh, so he opens an information office and an information office, his, in his information office, he negotiate contracts on behalf of those recently emancipated freedmen. In Dunn's early life, there are two institutions that parallel each other that are of great importance to his rise to political power. The first of these institutions is the AME Church. And those of you who are familiar with St. James AME just off of Canal Street um, must realize that that is the largest black Protestant church in the city. And it's the largest AME church in the deep South. Um, the church itself had been uh, founded by a group of free black men who are associated with the Masons, the what we call the Prince Hall Masons today. And this relationship between the church and the Masons exists till today. One of the things that's fascinating if you go to the church and you take the time to tour the church and look at the stained glass windows, um, you'll see that they're filled with uh, Masonic imagery and symbols. And the Masons still visit the church today. And in fact, this is the interior of the church. And you can see the Masons uh, visiting the church. Um, you can see all the Masons sitting in the front pews that are visiting the church then. The other institution, and like I said, it, it is, that's linked to the church is Freemasonry. And Dunn enters Freemasonry and rises to the rank of the Grand Lodge's Grand Master. So Dunn is the head Mason for all of the Black Masons that reside in the state. Oscar James Dunn becomes one of the first Black men considered for political office in Reconstruction Louisiana and he is uh, one of the men who is organizing the push for not only uh, civil rights for black men, but voting rights for black men in the state. Uh, he is the president of the Friends of Universal Suffrage. And the Friends of Universal Suffrage, as many of you remember, um, will petition Abraham Lincoln uh, to try to give limited enfranchisement to those African-American men in the city who had served in the armed forces, those men who were free before the war, and those men um, that may have a, a great degree of education. And we know that when they send their delegates to Lincoln, that Lincoln is very impressed with the men that are sent to him because Lincoln mentions the two men and he mentions the free men of Louisiana in his very last address, his very last address before his assassination. 
Uh, a critical point in the rise of Oscar James Dunn to political power will be the summer of 1866. And in the summer of 1866, there were two uh, uh, very important uprisings in the United States. The first took place in Memphis, Tennessee, and the second will take place in New Orleans at Mechanics Hall. The Mechanics Hall massacre, or the Mechanics Hall riot as it's called, uh, was an attempt to quail the organization of black voters and to quell their petitions for civil rights. And it outraged um, uh, Congress and it scared them into believing that maybe the civil, civil war isn't quite over. Maybe we still need a physical presence there and maybe we can't trust these former Confederates to govern themselves. So, the South is divided into a number of districts and generals are sent to each of those districts to administer um, a martial government there. After all the former Confederates were removed or after many of the former, former Confederates were removed, um, blacks are selected uh, first by Philip Sheridan, the general that's sent to administer the district. Uh, and they're first appointed to positions in 1867. Uh, Dunn will be appointed to the junior board. He will be one of two men to serve on the board of aldermen. There will be a junior board and a senior board. The senior board will receive one free black man by the name of Francis Dumas. Um, and Dunn will represent the junior board of aldermen. In that same year, Dunn will uh, also be given the position of a assistant recorder of the city's second district. And that will make Dunn the first African-American man to serve in a judicial capacity in the state. And I love the story um, that appears in the dissertation and, and appears in the book about the first time uh, Dunn is able to assume the court. Um, in his very first case, uh, both the lawyer for the defendant and um, the prosecutor both object to Dunn's ability as a black man to serve at the head of the court. And Dunn has to, uh, has to find both parties uh, and to get them to respect his right to serve as a judge in that venue. The following year, uh, Dunn will be nominated as the first black executive officer. And this is a, a position that Dunn was very reluctant about assuming. Uh, Dunn uh, had recently married. He married in the fall of 1866. Uh, he married a widower by the name of Boyd, uh, Ellen Boyd. And after marrying Ellen Boyd, and Ellen Boyd had two children um, and a niece, uh, Charlotte Kennedy, that also lived with them. Uh, Dunn is now a family man. He very much wants to return to his business, which had uh, been extremely successful at that point. Uh, but as he is at the Republican convention, uh, there is a schism which takes place at the convention. And this schism, is between uh, the free blacks and the Afro Creos at the at the at the at the the convention, and what is called uh, the conservative element of the convention. Uh, Dunn, at that point, will be nominated by a PBS pinchback as lieutenant governor, and uh, like I said, he was reluctant to take this position. Um, the person who is nominated as governor is Henry Clay Warmoth. And Henry Clay Warmoth um, was a member of the Friends of Universal Suffrage. He was first introduced to the Friends of Universal Suffrage by Dunn. And it, this would be a move that Dunn would come to regret. Uh, Dunn, like many of uh, 
the other free men of the city believed that they could influence Washington, D.C. and its politicians by having also white men in their coalition. And Warmoth said all the right things in the beginning. He was he maintained that he was really for civil rights and he was all for blacks to have voting rights. Um, however, uh, this would change after he would be elected. On September 26 of 1868, um, a bill would come before the newly elected Governor Warmoth. And that bill was a Civil Rights Act, often referred to as the Isabel Bill. And Warmoth, everyone who had served with them and the Friends of Universal Suffrage believed that Warmoth would sign the bill. They believed that Warmoth wanted nothing more uh, than equality for everyone. But when the bill comes on his desk, he vetoes it and says that he doesn't believe that now is the time for um, this equality. He believes that it has to come at such some later date. Um, Dunn puts aside all rivalries that he had uh, had with the, the Afro Creos in the city by taking the nomination alongside Warmoth and they form a coalition. And this coalition will split the Republican Party in two, creating a radical faction comprised mainly of uh, free Blacks, uh, emancipated Blacks, and afro Creos, and a conservative faction comprised overwhelmingly of white Republicans. Uh, these two factions would argue amongst themselves into uh, really 1870. In 1870, uh, Warmoth will injure his foot and uh, be forced into a, a forced convalescence, of a, so to speak. And he will not relent his position of, of governor, even though he's out of the state. When Dunn hears that Warmoth is out of the state, uh, he will have a locksmith break into Warmoth's office he will assume the post of acting governor under the constitution's provisions that he act as governor in the absence of Warmoth. And he begins passing bills uh, to undo what he sees as the damage that Warmoth has done and to fill positions with men that are in the radical faction. Um, this fight becomes increasingly more volatile. Um, they are opposing police forces. There are opposing um, issues in the Democratic Party. And actually support of Dunn grows during this period of time. In Warmoth's, at, in Warmoth's absence, Dunn governs the city very, very well. And people who had once been critical of Oscar James Dunn, men like uh, Beauregard, and Beauregard famously will not allow Dunn to sit on one of the trains going north, the Great Northern Railroad. Um, after the Civil War, uh, Pierre Toutant Gustave Beauregard becomes president of the railroad. And Dunn will try, will attempt to take a railroad car north on a trip to DC to visit the newly inaugurated President Grant. And um, Beauregard will refuse to sit Dunn in a sleeping car and will instead have him take the whole trip sitting up uh, in what he called the Negro car. Um, Beauregard changes his point of view after um, 1870 about Dunn, and he says, if I had to choose between the two of them, Warmoth and Dunn, I would choose the Negro. Um, and that says a lot about uh, the amount of regard that people began to have for Oscar James Dunn. As, a, as the Lieutenant Governor, um, Voices in the legislature maintain that Dunn, uh, Democratic voices in the legislature maintain that Dunn always allowed a room for them to take the floor. 
He always uh, listened to their arguments and he tried to negotiate fairly with the Democrats. When it seemed um, assured that Dunn would be able to impeach Warmoth just before the impeachment, Dunn would fall ill after attending a public dinner. Uh, Dunn will be nursed very briefly at his home uh, before falling dead within days. So he, within days of uh, attending this dinner, he'll become violently ill and will die, leading many of his supporters to speculate that Dunn had been poisoned. Dunn's funeral will be held on November 23rd, 1871. And Throughout the city, this was declared a day of mourning. All city offices were closed. Democrats and Republicans alike would gather. Um, tens of thousands of visitors viewed Dunn's body and Dunn's body was held and stayed in this home. So um, there was a long throng of, of followers to visit the house. And they said that, um, People could go through the house, exit, and encircle the house, walk through the house, have to return from the back door, and walk all the way around the front. Um, so th there was enormous lines to visit his bodies, his body. And we know a, a great deal about um, what was inside of the house. There, were, I was able to find uh, articles that described his house described the clothes that uh, he was wearing um, while he lay in his casket, uh, discussing the regalia and things that were uh, put to rest with him. Um, the funeral procession that followed Dunn numbered in the thousands. There were bands, there were benevolent societies, military groups, police units, um, ward lodges, political clubs, um, brass bands, and it's recorded as the largest funeral procession ever in the city of New Orleans. And since many of us are New Orleanians, we know that that has a special significance to us. I mean, we are the place uh, that gave, you know, the American place of the second line. And this notion of having a large funeral procession, we've seen lots of big uh, second lines. Uh, very few of us have seen a, a second line that numbered in the tens of thousands of individuals. One of the things that students, and, and I, I talk about Dunn a great deal in school, and it's always hard to sort of condense Dunn's life into a 45 minute discussion or just a few minutes of discussion, but uh, often have to elaborate on how Dunn was viewed, not just in the city where, or in Louisiana where there's these two rival parties, but how he's viewed nationally. And I took this short uh, article from the New National Era, um, a newspaper in Washington, DC. Uh, this comes from November, 1871, gifted with remarkably sound judgment there was no man in Louisiana whose opinion and counsel upon questions of state were often sought by honest men of both parties. His parliamentary talent has long been the theme of admiration and for the dispatch of business in his official chair, few men in the union have been as equal. However, that's not even my favorite one. My, my, one of my favorites said that there will be three images that will hang in the homes of African Americans to come. That of Abraham Lincoln, that of Grant, and that of Oscar James Dunn. Um, when we talk about the importance of Dunn, we also must uh, remember that Dunn is the first African American who's openly discussed as a vice presidential candidate of any of the major parties. And uh, he's discussed in the Grant letters, in one of the Grant letters, as a potential running mate for Grant in 1872. And often uh, 
Um, we talk about this in class and uh, historians are often warned about this counterfactual argument, something I tell my students all the time. We can't say what might have happened. We can suggest, we can talk about it, but it's all hypothetical. Uh, we have to deal with, with facts, but it, it, he's one of my favorite counterfactual discussions to have. You know, how would uh, the South have been different had done not died? What would Louisiana have looked like if the radical power base had not dissipated after Dunn's death? When we talk about what Dunn stood up for, we must remember um, some of the stances that he took. He opposed the apprenticeship of children on plantations, and he openly worked to make sure that children weren't re-enslaved by these policies that were put in place to reestablish slavery after the passage of the 13th Amendment. He was also uh, um, well known for his positions in regard to the advancement of Black people economically. And one of the things that I didn't make a slide for, because I have way too many slides now, is something he called the bakery for the people. And the bakery for the people was modeled after European, European collectives. What Dunn realized is that if Black people were truly going to be free, that they had to have economic freedom to control their own destinies. They had to have wealth. They had to control their own labor. They had to have their own businesses. And he knew that there was very little capital to do this. So what he, uh, what he proposed was the creating of a collective where dues would be paid by members and those dues used to purchase places of businesses. And they, they called it the bakery of the people because he believed that bakeries should be where, they, where people started. And he said, bakeries are a staple uh, food and it's important that we can we control um, the staple food and where we purchase food. So this notion of black ownership. I also point out that Dunn had a very different perspective about the notions of integration than others. Dunn is the first to integrate public schools in Louisiana. And he uses his own children as the test cases. And right after the Christmas holiday of 18, 1869 and 1870, he will integrate uh, the schools using his children as the first students to be admitted. And up until then, all white public schools. And at last presentation, someone asked what was the first school in the city um, that was integrated. And it was the Madison School for Girls uh, is the school that he and his wife decide to send his, um, the three girls uh, that they had, um, the two, two daughters and the niece Charlotte uh, Kennedy will all be sent and enrolled in the, uh, the Madison School. They did have a son. Um, none of these are Dunn's blood children. They're all adopted, named Charles um, Charles Dunn also. This is one of my favorite quotes um, from Black Reconstruction. With sufficient and general agreement and determination among the dominant classes, the truth of history may be utterly distorted, contradicted, and changed to any convenient fairy tale that the masters of men wish. And this is very, very important, particularly uh, from the state uh, which I'm in right now and this discussion of uh, CRT and this notion of what CRT is because there's this misbelief uh, that CRT is any ethnic history. Um, and that's not what CRT is, but there, there's this wish to uh, um, uh, take a broad brush and repaint history again. And I think it's important to note that this isn't the first time that that happened. This happened immediately following the Civil War. And this repainting of history is how Dunn disappeared from the historical record. 
a monument denied. Um, most New Orleanians up until I, I did the NPR interview were totally unaware that there was supposed to be an Oscar James Dunn monument. Um, an act was passed and by the legislature in 1873 called Act uh, Number 57. And this established a committee uh, to organize and to develop a monument for Dunn. And you can see uh, the members of that committee, C.C. Antoine, who will become Lieutenant Governor, C.F. Ladd, James Lewis, one of Dunn's uh, extremely close friends, Henri Birch, um, Dunn's, one of Dunn's best friends, and the man who would marry Dunn's widow, Paul Trevine, um, the Tribune writer, P.F. Jo uh, Jobert, Aristide Mary, and James Ingraham all uh, make up this board that is put in place to design a monument for Dunn. And monies were allocated for this monument. However, the monument was never erected. And that's a huge question that people begin to ask. You know, why? What took place in the years uh, you know, between the passing of this act that people would forget about the monument and never erect it? And the first thing I have to point out is on uh, April 13th, that's Easter Sunday of 1873, uh, the Colfax massacre would occur uh, and former Confederates will come to the county seat to try to take over um, the, the county seat and install the sheriff that they desired to install. Uh, black men uh, wanting to protect the government that was in place there will go there uh, with few arms between them to protect it. Uh, they were not prepared for the hundreds of former Confederates that showed up and they were massacred. And what's important about the Colfax massacre and what's often overlooked is the Supreme Court ruling that comes from it, the Crookshank case as it's called. The Crookshank case will make it um, extremely hard for federal for federal oversight in murder cases. And this will open the door to violence because the federal government cannot step into um, these state trials unless it involves a federal officer. And whites realize that to simply take control of the state, they can employ um, inordinate use of violence to do this. Most of you know that 18, 1876, we have um, the Battle of Liberty Place. Uh, that's one example of this violence that we're talking about, being employed to, to retake the South. And then comes the election of 1876, the so-called uh, compromise that ensues when the election ends in a, in a tie. And the reason the election ends in a tie is violence and intimidation will rule the day. Um, so much that black voters are kept from polls. And to solve this tie, Republicans are willing to forfeit their black voters. And that's exactly what happens. And in a, in, a, in a deal that's forged, and this deal is often referred to as the 1877 Compromise, um, Republicans will relent to Democrats if Democrats will allow them the presidency. So Hayes is able to become president. And in exchange for Hayes becoming president, exchange for Hayes becoming president, Republicans will promise not to interfere in race relations in the South. They will pull their troops from the last remaining outposts in the South and allow the South to govern itself. One of the things that um, begins to rule the day after the troops have left is violence. This idea of returning the South to what 
it had been previously, the notion of the redeemers. The United States troops took over the state, and this is at the base. This is at the base of what was the Liberty Monument. It, and what I want you guys to take a look at is this notion uh, of white supremacy. And, and students began to ask me, uh, when does this notion of white supremacy begin to be taught as a factor. You know, the Civil War wasn't about slavery, uh, Pollard will write. It was truly about the notion of white supremacy. So immediately after the Civil War um, in the Lost Cause, a writer would begin rewriting that narrative in much the same way as today we're seeing people rewrite what happened in the January 6th uprising. Uh, and we're watching it happen before our eyes. People watch the rewriting of the Civil War immediately after. They watch people say, no, no, it really wasn't about slavery at all. It's about all whites um, being able to run the country. This is from the Colfax uh, Cemetery, and this is... Um, um, a marker at the tombs of the men that were white men that were killed at Colfax. And once again, you'll see this notion of white supremacy uh, being at the heart of the massacre. As I said, the story of Dunn becomes more relevant as uh, Mitch Landrew, former mayor, uh, begins taking down the monuments and a discussion, a discourse, public discourse, begins to open up about what should fill our public space. And um, this discussion includes lots of people who, who maintain that the public space should be filled with uh, people who did good things and good things for everyone, you know, not these relics to white supremacy. And then people began to ask, well, how can we get a monument and who should those monuments actually um, showcase? And Dunn then open and becomes uh, an ideal person for um, this sort of public recognition. Uh, this is a cover of the book, and the book that I wrote is Monumental, Oscar Dunn and His Radical Fight in Reconstruction, Louisiana. One of the things I'd like to say um, as I close out my presentation and open the floor for discussion is I'd like to talk a little bit um, about what's going on right now in regard to Dunn's commemoration. Um, the city, uh, the committee that was appointed for the renaming of, of streets and parks and the recommemoration of these parks, the renaming of these parks has decided that the Washington Battery Park uh, would be renamed in honor of Oscar James Dunn. And for those who aren't familiar with that park, if, you, if you're at Jackson Square and you walk up the, the levee, uh, the park at the top of that hill on the levee is the Washington Battery Park, named after the Washington Battery a Confederate Artillery Unit. That park will be renamed after Oscar James Dunn. And it's my hope that a statue or monument befitting of Dunn's importance, both on a local, uh, statewide, and national level, will be erected. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> we have um, 
thank you all for using the, uh, the uh, Q&A feature. We have a few questions. That was fantastic. So I'll begin with the first question. What did Oscar Dunn do during the Civil War? That's a good question because what I discovered about Oscar James Dunn and his, his suppose, because for years people believed there were two narratives that were put in place. The first narrative maintained that Dunn had been part of the Native Guard. Um, the second maintained that Dunn had no participation in the war. And I'm supporting the second. Uh, Dunn, Dunn's identity was mistaken by writers after his death with PBS Pinchback. And his service, Pinch's Pinchback service is often attributed to Dunn. Dunn did not serve in the military during the war. I was able to prove that by looking at Masonic records of the lodge to show at the time that the Native Guard was fighting in Port Hudson, Dunn was in the city of New Orleans holding meetings. So no, Dunn was not, um, not part of uh, a military unit during the war. And to, furthermore, all of the commemorations, all of the lists, all of the muster rolls, I've gone through them. Dunn doesn't appear on any of them. And none of the local papers that list veterans uh, is Dunn listed among the veterans of, of the war. And he's often at the function. So um, he li he's listing off names of other politicians that participated. And you would assume if he had participated, they would um, have listed him alongside them. Thank you. Next question. Dr. Mitchell, do you have any idea where he may have acquired the legal knowledge needed to open his information um, office for contracting? Um, what Parson maintains is that Dunn was an avid reader. And in fact, uh, George Cable, once it, it's said by a lot of people that George Cable in one of his books, um, will fashion a character after Dunn, a bookstore owner. And George Cable knew him and that's what he loved to do. Uh, according to Parsons, if he could read books all day, if he could open a bookstore, he would have been totally content in his life just opening a bookstore and sitting in his bookstore selling books and reading them. Um, but he read uh, everything he could get his hands on. He was very intrigued by law and his parliamentary upbringing, his skill comes from um, all of the, the activities and positions he held in Freemasonry. Um, he held a number of positions, he sat on a number of committees, and much of his skill in regard to negotiating, debating, uh, Robert's Rules of Order and those sort of things, you know, how to ha handle a meeting. Um, and he's praised, even when he goes to DC and other places, for being this excellent parliamentarian. Um, he's praised um, highly for that throughout the country. So uh, many of those skills, what, what he doesn't get from books, he gets from Freemasonry. Thank you. Next question. How does Dunn's story interweave uh, into the story of Plessy versus Ferguson? Well, you have to understand Dunn, Dunn is dead before Plessy versus Ferguson. But when we talk about the unraveling or the undoing of the gains of reconstruction, when we look at the 13th, the 14th and the 15th amendment as these hallmark gains that we have first, um, the ending of slavery except as punishment of crime, the opening up of uh, uh, civil rights for, uh, for Blacks, and the establishment of, of suffrage, uh, all male suffrage, and this giving Blacks the right to vote. One of the things that we have to talk about is how did they take this away? And they were able to take this away under separate but equal, uh, separate but equal, um, then allowed states to define what, what became, and this is really, really fascinating when people ask about like what's important about uh, 
the Plessy decision. And there are a number of things that are important, but one of the things that's often overlooked is that who becomes Black is defined by the state after Plessy. Because if you're going to say Blacks and whites have to be kept separately, that means you have to define what Black is and you have to define what white is. And it became uh, what the government really hadn't policed as heavily in Louisiana was this color line. People were going back and forth over the color line quite um, frequently, but it began to be policed by the state. And when we talk about the Office of Vital Records became a critical role in policing who was black and who was right. Um, and that's why when, if those of you who read, who've read um, Our People, Our History, um, this notion of people passing for white in great number in the early 20th century um, happens immediately after, you know, Plessy because they begin to police it at that point. And if you're going to be on the side that has all the advantages, you better pass quick before the records start uh, appearing and you get categorized as um, a black person. So we, you know, we have in the census, you know, it's mass disappearance of black people. That's still, you know, some people say is an accident. Other people said, no, it's a testament to actually how many people pass during that period of time. Um, Thank you. Next question. What happened to his wife and children after he died? That's fascinating. Um, Dunn dies and within a few years, five years, his um, friend James Henry Birch, Henry Birch marries um, his widow. So uh, Ellen Dunn marries Birch and Birch had been in East Feliciana. So um, that's another East Feliciana sort of connection or East Baton Rouge is where he was. Um, and they're going back and forth to East Baton Rouge. And then when Birch dies, she's only married to Birch for a few years, Birch dies, uh, she decides to go on a tour and she has a fascinating life with Birch. She becomes a spokesman for African-American women. And oddly enough, she's against uh, the suffrage of women. She speaks openly against the suffrage of women for a particular reason. She thinks that white women are gonna use it to sort of um, uh, maintain a majority and uh, to counter the black vote. So she uh, speaks pretty openly about that. She speaks pretty openly to a, a number of presidents on issues of African-Americans in Louisiana. Uh, she becomes a countess at the Mint when the Mint was uh, at the foot of the river. Uh, and after her husband dies, she decides to take a tour to the North to visit friends. And on that tour, she stops at her birthplace, which is Cincinnati, Ohio. And she dies while visiting her family. And uh, she is buried alongside her father. And her father is famous in his own right. Most people don't know that. One of the first um, black millionaires in the country was her father, a man by the name of Henry Boyd in Cincinnati and he, he was an escaped slave from Kentucky that made his way to Cincinnati and he would invent a, a bed, a frontier bed called the Boyd bed. And the Boyd beds were collapsible beds that you could take on a covered wagon and bring to the West. And he opens a factory, becomes very, very wealthy making the Boyd bed and he becomes really, um, an A-lister, so to speak, in the free Black community of, of Cincinnati. Unfortunately, his factories would be burned down a number of times, consecutive times, and insurance companies wouldn't cover it. So he loses his fortune. Um, but she dies while visiting her family. Uh, I've been tracing, trying to trace down her children at this point. And I've only been able to trace 
one of them. And I, I don't want to give too much away about that because that's sort of current research that I'm working on. Um, they didn't always keep the done name. So names will switch and the person I'm tracing leaves the country. So um, it becomes a complicated narrative that hopefully I'll find more about and I'll be writing about shortly. Wow. Thank you. Next question. I would love to know where was Oscar J. Dunn's home in New Orleans? If you get the book, there are maps inside of the book. There are maps inside the book of all the important landmarks in Dunn's life. And um, on, in the map, the landmarks that are in purple are still there. So they're, they're things that are associated with Dunn's life that you can still visit today. I made sure to mark that so if schools want to take field trips or want to go out, or if they're tours or people are visiting the city and they want to see things that were there doing reconstruction, they can actually just walk up and down Canal. Uh, his home was on Canal in Claiborne. So on the, if you're at the foot of Canal, on the left-hand side, first block, far corner, would have been his home. It's no longer there. It was razzed many, many years ago when we started talking about before even the interstate was developed. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Mitchell. You mentioned Dunn's economic plan using bakeries as a model to build wealth. Can you talk a little bit more about how important bakeries and Black bakers were in New Orleans? Um, that's not especially, I know, I, it's, it's, I would wish I could know everything about everything, <laughs> but I'm not a, a specialty on culinary history. So I couldn't tell you very much about black bakers in the city. What I can tell you is that Dunn, uh, bakers were just the beginning of Dunn's aspirations for the bakeries. He hoped that they would build uh, by building, um, by uh, newspaper presses. He hoped that they would um, be, uh, opening coffee shops. He hoped that they would open restaurants. He hoped to build from bakeries because everyone used bread um, and build a wealth base from there. And one of the things he says, why should we, you know, this was a huge debate between Afro-Creos and the Anglo-Africans, the, the, those who weren't from the Afro-Creo community, Blacks that had come from Virginia and English colonies. The Afro-Creos had a very, um, French uh, Revolution sense of, of integrating everything, that all clubs would be integrated, all facets of society would be integrated. And Dunn didn't believe that. Dunn said, we have to have our own stuff. He wanted, he was against the integration of Masonic lodges because he believed that would be a method that would be employed by white lodges to steal political power from Blacks. So he said, it's important that we have our own stuff. We don't have to have all of our and we don't have to share everything. We, we do have to share um, public spaces. We do have to share trains. But if they don't want me, and, and he said, a man cannot legislate himself into another man's parlor. He said, if you don't want me in your restaurant, we can build our own restaurant. You know, we can go our own. You don't want you don't want me in your opera house. We can build our own opera houses and have our own. So. His ideas about integration uh, are very, very complex and, and, and extremely um, uh, nuanced in comparison to uh, what many people think. A lot of my, my, my students believe that, okay, he wanted to open up everything. No, I mean, he realized, and what he believed about public schools is that he said, I can't change adults' minds. He said, people have their mindset, but I can have children grow up alongside each other and erode these stereotypes and racisms that are based on these stereotypes by experience. And that was a critical component of what he believed would dismantle uh, racism in the nation long term was if they could uh, have a public school system that uh, was integrated. What you have to remember is Reconstruction was also the boom of parochial schools and religious schools in the city. 
So as soon as he integrates uh, public schools, uh, white children flee from the public schools and begin going to religious schools. Um, and they, there was an attempt by the radicals to integrate the Catholic schools. Uh, Blanc Jobert will send his daughter to Sacred Heart and he'll show up there and you know, that's the elite Catholic girls school. So he shows up there and he says, I'd like to enroll my daughter. And they say, well, we don't, you know, we don't take black girls. And he said, well, you have to, it's 14th amendment. And they're like, well, you don't have enough money. And he was like, well, how much is it? And he pulls out a whole satchel of gold, and pours it on the table. <laughs> and then they say, well, no, we, we're not gonna admit her. And um, he sues them and he wins. And they, they, they consider closing the school down. They actually do close the school down rather than let his daughter in. And he wins, I think the judgment is something like $10,000, $10,000 from the archdiocese uh, in that lawsuit. So, it, I mean, this is, it's fascinating that they have these test cases and it's fascinating how the radicals are involved in these test cases. And when you ask that thing about uh, the question about Plessy versus Ferguson, the reason you have the Committee of Citizens believe that they can win this case is because of all these victories that these radicals had during Reconstruction. They mm -hmm. said, hey, we were able to integrate the star cars. We were able to enter, you know, we were able to go to the gym saloon. And, you know, when Sylvanet goes there and sues at the saloon when he's refused service, we were able to reintegrate the, the theaters. We were able, and they, they believe that, okay, we'll just do this test case. And if we win it, you know, everything will return to normal. What, what they hadn't considered is what if the Supreme Court comes up with a, a crazy ruling? And that's exactly what happens. The Supreme Court says, no, nah, we'll just separate everything. Mm, true. So um, we have a little more time left. You're still welcome to use the Q&A feature. I'll just ask my questions. Those were all your questions, you all. Thank you so much. So I'll just go ahead and ask some of my questions. And then as your questions come in, I will ask them. So I had a question about um, the runaway ads um, as it relates to um, Oscar Dunn. So okay. um, what was, so you said it, but I was like, what? <laughs> okay. So in terms of the runaway ad was, was that an effort to undermine his status as a free man of color? Or was that an actual, like, I guess I didn't understand the context. Why, why, why they would put out an ad for him. He worked for a plasterer. He uh, was one of the plasterers and he would, the plasterer was under contract to do work. He refused to work and ran away from the, the job. So they put out a contract for his arrest and return. Um, he wasn't a slave, but um, if arrested, they could force him to go back to, to work. And I found records to suggest that he was ever arrested for it. Um, so he was able to evade them for some time, at least so they gave up or finished whatever work they were doing and lost interest in him. And at some later date, he returns to plastering. So in, in we know that it didn't impede him from working in the future because um, after, after the Martin affair, he becomes a plasterer again. Thank you. And I guess, um, and you've, you've touched upon this. Um, I see a question, thank you. Um, you've touched upon this and what was the term you use, uh, counter? Not counter narrative, counter history. Factual, counterfactual. Factual. <laughs> yeah. I'd um, like to counterfactualize that if he went to a public dinner. Okay. And he got violently sick after that public dinner. I'd like to counterfactualize. It does, in fact, sound like he was poisoned. But I'll yeah, go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're I, I think in the plot. So there <laughs> so are things. The next question. One of the ways that they pass graft during Reconstruction mm -hmm. from 
politician and a politician was through a series of contracts to newspapers. So all the politicians, all the political groups, every politician had their their own newspaper, <laughs> and that's oh. what has money to you. So um, one of the black politicians who was a rival of Dunn's was a PBS Pinchback. And Pinchback was very much tied to a newspaper called The Louisianian. And in The Louisianian, um, Pinchback will write an article threatening Dunn that says, look, if you don't uh, resign, I will come out with this salacious story about your wife and your family. Mm. And um, according to, In I think it's Ingraham, he's approached by Pinchback on Memorial Day. And he tells him, look, tell Dunn, I've got this story and I'm gonna print it if you know he doesn't get out of politics. So there's a theory that it could have been like an honor killing with Dunn. Dunn realizes, um, I don't wanna do anything that would bring a bad reputation to my family. Mm. So there's um, a belief by some that he may have committed suicide mm. rather than have some something come out that would ruin his wife. And one of the things that I, I do discover is that Dunn lived with his wife and her husband as a boarder for years. So mm. before Dunn marries her, when she was married to someone else, Dunn had lived in the house with them as a boarder at their house. Mm. That, if that had been disclosed or if people became and she has a child during that time. She has Charles during that time that he's living there. I don't know, maybe people were going to suggest that possibly Charles was actually Dunn's child through some illicit affair. Uh, but Dunn's, um, or at least Parsons' suggestion about this is that he reconnected with her after her husband died and began began courting her um, after the Civil War. And, you know, in, in reconnecting in 1864 and 65, you know, he maintains that they have this romance and they get married in 1866. But I can see where people might say, mm, that's mighty convenient, you know? Her husband dies and she marries the guy that was living with them. Sure. So we have four questions that you've answered to <laughs> okay. just now. Um, and so the latter two questions are, Dr. Mitchell, uh, what was Lieutenant Governor Dunn's and Judge Torgy's relationship? And then the last one, um, was there a public inauguration a ceremony when Dunn was elected? And do we have a record of the speeches given that day? I couldn't find, and, and I was very curious about that too, um, Albion Torgy. Uh, I couldn't find any letters that sort of link them or anything of real substance that link them together in any sort of um, political affairs. But I've often been curious about that too, because he was uh, quite um, uh, well written and, and things like that, but I haven't found anything that gives a real strong connection between the two. As for PBS Pinchback, Dunn, Pinchback starts off in Dunn's camp and they are friends and Pinchback is very, very different from Dunn. Dunn didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't go out. Um, uh, and Pinchback had once owned a coffee house and coffee houses really weren't like what we're thinking of PJs. It, they were uh, bars, a saloon sort of, where all sorts of people threw dice and things like that. And uh, Warma, uh, like I said, Pinchback was a little bit more, a lot more scandalous. You know, he had been in a workhouse for a while, so he'd been arrested. Um, he'd been a gambler on the riverboat. He always seemed to me like he was an interesting guy. <laughs> 
But, you know, he was a little on the shadier side. We can thank him for City Park. His City Park was all his doing, you know. He bought a patch of land for hardly anything, then turns around and in a few days sells it to the city for $500,000 <laughs> and makes this enormous fortune. You know, so, you know, he was always, he was a wheeler dealer sort of person that was going trying to make his name. And he was in Dunn's camp, but I don't think Dunn t- trusted him very much because he didn't move up in that Dunn hierarchy. And um, Pinchback will say very famously that he won't pay second fiddle to Dunn and Dunn's friends, and he will leave the Dunn camp and then ally himself with Warmoth. And Warmoth will personally select him to be his replacement. When Dunn dies and Warmoth is impeached, um, he will select Pinchback to be the person to rise up and take his place. But the reason he does that is because he realizes nobody in the radical camp will support him. um, And no one in the conservative camp will support him without Warmoth's support. So he really needs Warmoth. He can't really do anything on his own without Warmoth. He will stab Warmoth in the back. <laughs> and, um, and that's quite interesting. And he, he, there's a very interesting scandal that takes place on New Year's Eve, um, right after Dunn's death, as um, Pinchback comes into power. Pinchback will go to a party right across the street from Dunn's house to the Stackhouse family's party. And he'll just barge in, you know, everybody's having their, their, their celebrations. He barges in drunk. He starts manhandling the women over there with his boys. And (laughs) uh, one of the guys who's there was a really good friend of Dunn, a black journalist and one of the highest ranking military officers, black military officers in the United States. And this is, this is happening while Warmoth is governor of the state. So he go, imagine he comes to your house. The governor comes to your house, starts manhandling you and your, your daughters, yeah. and friends, talking crazy. And the officer, the Morris, steps between the women and Pinchback. And one of Pinchback's boys shoots Morris in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then they all jump into the stagecoach and take off. And no, and people are like, the newspapers are like, okay, who's going to go arrest the governor? <laughs> oh, God. So for like weeks, people are like, okay, are we going to arrest him? Are we just going to, what are we going to do? So, um, yeah, he's the only sitting governor I know that, you know, was really involved, you know, in like a, a you hate to even say a drive-by, a, <laughs> a ride-by on the stage. <laughs> oh, there was a gangster. Someone, while he's governor, you know. Jeez. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. This was a treat. Um, Reconstruction is my favorite era to to read about, to learn about, and to actually teach on. So um, thank you so much for your very knowledgeable um, take on uh, this this topic. I see uh, Charles Schmidt has a question. Okay, if you wanted to answer, we can go ahead and answer that one last question. The relationship is, um, my my great-grandfather's name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel Dunn. And there were a number of Dunns that were here. There were uh, Fabius McKinnon Dunn. There were a number of uh, Blacks migrated from Virginia to uh, Louisiana and, um, and from the Carolinas in Louisiana that were related to Dunn, to the Dunns. And he was a part of those distant relatives that came that were related to James Dunn. So um, my family is related to James Dunn through, you know, so they, they're cousins to to um, to Dunn's father, James Dunn. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad we were able to answer that last question. So thank you all so much. Um, Dr. Mitchell, it was a true pleasure. Well, I always like when they're funny. You guys had great 
funny questions. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you all. You all have been a great audience as per usual. So um, I bid you all good night and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. You have a great night. You too. Bye -bye. All right, bye.